Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm here with my co-host, Kari. This is Instinct, the podcast about leadership, one animal at a time. I know we shouldn't pick favorites, but it's hard to not be obsessed with elephants. And that's who we'll talk about today. This exploration of elephants will take us beyond the commonly known adage, an elephant never forgets. Today, we'll talk about how elephants listen through their feet and create meaningful rituals that last generations. Here's another thing elephants teach. Leadership doesn't need to be militaristic. After this episode, you may find yourself in the place that I did, wishing that as humans, we could all be just a little bit more like elephants, caring and peace-oriented creatures. All right, open your big elephant ears (laughs) and feel the deep rumbles in your feet. Let's get started. Let's do it. Let's talk about elephants. Let's talk about elephants. Will you kick us off? For sure. So, turns out, elephants are part of matriarchal societies. Well, they are in matriarchal societies, which essentially just means, like, there's one big, bad elephant (laughs) woman (laughs) who tends to be the oldest, tends to be the um, biggest woman in the like family unit and then there's kind of like these concentric circles mostly of her daughters and like extended female elephants um around her and that matriarch is responsible for like critical decision making moments of like where to find food and water where when danger is approaching and like the herd or the family might need to leave like is kind of the go-to decision maker on behalf of the whole unit And matriarchs, as far as I understand, really are built or grown or evolved through imitation and longevity. It's basically like I learned from you and you learned from your mom and you she learned from her mom and like straight down the line. And that's why memory is such an important piece of the elephant puzzle, I think, because the matriarch being such a decision maker on behalf of the collective requires like actual lived experience that is taught over time. So elephants live a long time, but they also have memory that spans over their lifetimes. And it seems like actually beyond their lifetimes into the next generation. But like the matriarch is kind of the, I don't know, I'm kind of imagining it as like the conduit for Mm -hmm. information passing through generations. Yeah, and that was something that I that I read also that I hadn't heard of in other groups of animals that we've researched is that if there's an event, especially a traumatic event, that in research, um, longitudinal research, you start to see the reverberation of that in every generation, right? It shifts the constellation of the community uh, in a way that it doesn't necessarily happen in other groups of animals in the same way. Can you share a little bit more about like, what do you hear about the the reverberations or the shifts, like, let's get more specific. What did you, what did you read about? Yeah. So a couple of things that I read, and this is another one where I have a little bookmark next to it, which is like, wow, there is way more here and like probably more than I can actually wrap my head around. Uh, But when there's a sort of traumatic event that occurs, especially to one of the females in the group, especially if it's the matriarch, um, they're then as a result of that, the other females in the herd may have kind of erratic behavior. They might show a decline in skill-based behavior or memory, also changes to their physiology, mm. and also a harder time reproducing. Yep. And then those kinds of things can actually go beyond just the one generation through the generations in the herd. And the kind of trauma you're talking about that was kind of most obvious is like poaching right and it tends to happen for older elephants because like their tusks are larger and bigger and so there's like this often human elephant conflict but there can be other traumas that are like environmental that also have to do with humans but maybe less um 
less directly, at least less directly linked than like, I killed you, elephant, on behalf of your tusks, um, but that are like environmental. So lack of water or lack of food or lack of resources based off of environmental changes. Those also seem to be like real traumas that impact decision making from the matriarch and then the health of the entire family. Yeah, and something that was interesting that I read about with Asian elephants in particular was that most of the research that we had about the elephant social construction came out of watching elephants in captivity, where their social construction is not quite the same. And there was some some research that I read also showing uh, herds that were constructed out of a number of orphaned elephants that don't show the same sort of bond that sort of family intact wild herds of elephants do. And so we had a misunderstanding about the complexity of the way that elephants interacted. And this is one of those maybe like silver lining, but really sad moments is in the decimation of the Asian elephant jungle forest environment. They now live primarily in open plains and so we can study them and see what's going on with their social construction because we can see them. Whereas when they were living in the jungle, we couldn't. And so I think that's also just like a sad that they lost their in their habitat. And like most of the research we're probably reading came because now they can be observed. Right, right. Especially because elephants don't have as much of a defined kind of boundary in which they operate. They can travel over very long distances. It seems like it's kind of hard for researchers to like, you know, stay in one place and like track them over years and years. And especially with shifts in like water patterns, food patterns, environmental patterns, like it seems like elephants are sort of making treks that might not be as, you know, consistent or obvious to researchers over over decades and periods of time. There's, we're talking about kind of two broad things here. You brought up like the matriarchy, kind of like the social structure, and then also like the memory. And those feel really interestingly linked to me. Like it's hard for me to totally piece them apart in part because memory, maybe I'll say this, like in my research about elephant memory. So elephants have like big brains, like some of the biggest of land mammals and they also have some of the more complex cognitive functioning skills as a result of that and other kind of parts of their physiology or morphology. And long-term memory is one of them, but memory consists of like many, many different types of things. And it seems like elephants have what I guess memory researchers would call both declarative memory, like they can mem- they can remember like facts and events and people and things and places, but they also have like procedural memory, which Mm -hmm. is like about skills and routines. And both of those things humans also have, but both of those things kind of enable, or researchers seem to think both of those enable kind of more complex social structures because you can have a sense of like norms and complex behaviors Mm -hmm. that can be remembered, not just like facts, places, items, numbers. So there's something to me that's interesting about matriarchy plus memory that is associated with complex social structures and awareness outside of the self as an individual. Yeah, I don't know what to do with that, but I wanted to put it in the, on the table. <laughs> yeah, I, th- that's the one of the other things that I read was that elephants have what we would call theory of mind, right? So potentially they have this uh, self awareness which I think sometimes humans get a little like in our heads and we're the only ones who have this self-awareness, right? Or consciousness or something like this. But elephants seem to demonstrate that as well as the higher order cognitive functionings. And I have I have like a little uh, chip on my shoulder about this, maybe about being a woman. So <laughs> check me. <laughs> but there's a demonstration of self-awareness, cooperation with one another, also, those sort of rituals that I mentioned earlier seem to come from this this kind of like two-pronged cognitive ability. So having rituals around major society events, not just individual events. Uh, empathy and kind of the, the like um, interconnection, right? Or like duty to support one another. The individuals within a herd have this sort of interdependence. And all of those in my research fall under the higher order functioning of a, of a brain, mm-hmm. um, you know, which we don't always see in humans, even though we have that ability. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't always see those things getting pulled into our organizations the way they seem to be woven into the fabric of, of elephant communities. You said you had a chip on your shoulder about it? Well, I was like, I was like, what's the difference between human society and elephant society that would have two beings that have the same theory of mind ability operate differently? And the thing that came to mind is that elephants are led by women and humans often have a more patriarchal sort of way of constructing ourselves. So that was the chip on my shoulder, which is like, would we use our higher order processing more if our societies were constructed around a more feminine way of doing things? It's a great question. That's something I feel sometimes confused about as we do this research on these animals. There's like both the anthropomorphizing of them (laughs) and the like socialization layer of like us on top of them. And there's like this sort of science brain part of me that's like, they evolved for survival. Like (laughs) all of these things evolved for survival, right? Like humans too. And like, we evolved for survival in some way through like power and domination. And like, it has worked. Turns out like industrialization, you can take over the world and like proliferate. So there's like, a, I have this other, I guess, chip that's kind of like, I don't know, like, isn't this all about just like survival and how do we put value judgments on like each of those? But I also yeah. hold that like, hmm, this seems kind of nice. Like, what if we all just cared about each other? <laughs> so I oscillate. I'm polarized on that front. There are a couple other things that, like in opposition to that that I read about, which is that uh, orphaned specifically orphaned male elephants were more violent. And I I also like had a little giggle in my head, which is that the violence that orphaned males commit is killing rhinos. <laughs> no, I saw that study too. It was about the, or at least I saw something that was like, there were a bunch of orphan males in some park when they were brought into that park, they killed like 40 rhinos. They didn't like hurt each other. And then like older male Elephants were also introduced and brought into the park, which totally simmered down the younger ones, Mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Is that what you were referring to? The same thing? Yeah, I read a different study, but same the same finding, which I think is fascinating. But specifically the orphaned males, right? It's like this when it's like the idea of hurt people, hurt people, hurt elephants, hurt rhinos. Um, (laughs) Hashtag created. (laughs) Hurt (laughs) elephants, hurt rhinos. There is something really cool about um, essentially behavior mod- behavior that gets moderated by being in group and instead of being isolated. And that there's a way, one of the things I wanted to name for you, I wrote it in my notes as like hierarchy for harmony question mark, mm. which is like, I think we, I associate hierarchy with some destructive tendencies. That's like a power over often form and it's like i'm higher up on this rank list and therefore i am better than you is Mm -hmm. tend tends to be how i see it you know um manifested as opposed to i am higher up in rank on behalf of all of us to take care of all of us and that responsibility of the hierarchy seems to be for elephants more about like moderation peacekeeping managing and resolving conflict understanding like decisions that need to get made for the collective, which kind of gave me a different appreciation for hierarchy, which I've sort of been like down with the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Um, So I thought that was really cool, actually, the shift from like, yeah, I guess hierarchy for domination versus hierarchy for harmony. Does any of that resonate with you? It, It does. And I want you to say more. And I was also wondering if you ran into the kind of fluid nature of human or of a elephant Look at me confusing humans and elephants, even in my speaking. <laughs> Is that why you wore that nice gray today, Kari? <laughs> yeah, I'm really trying to bring out my inner elephant. Um, but I, yeah, I was wondering if if you could say maybe two more sentences on that thought and if the fluid nature of elephant social construction happened to make it in there. I'd be curious what if you think that that plays in. Can you tell me what the fluid nature of elephant social construction means? Like there seems to be... I kept hearing this that elephant communities have fission and fusion system Mm. did you read this no um 
And I'm not sure that I totally understand what that means, to be mm. honest. Uh, Maybe but, confusion and confusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That must but, be it. <laughs> but there seems to be some sort of like strong affiliation, but also um, more movement or fluidity in the way that the that the herds are constructed. Mm. And so even though individuals have strong bonds with one another and there's also kind of a strong hierarchy, there's also a fluidness to the way that 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 happens like group members actually kind of come and go um, elephants best friends kind of change over time that some elephants who maybe don't have as many connections ha- or have higher degree of loyalty whereas the extroverted elephants maybe have a lower lower degree of loyalty so there's some sort of like fluidness in the way that all of this comes together um, so there is That's like so cool. a dedication to the collective, but there's also room and space within the collective to shift and change is how I heard that. I love that. I didn't read anything specifically about that, but I did see what you're reminding me of the idea of like, there is a sort of family herd of, I can't quite remember how many elephants, but let's call it like more than five, fewer than 50. Um, that's like your direct peeps. And then there's, evidence that kind of herds or families will kind of join up with other families over time up to like six, five or six groups of those people. And that's when you see like hundreds of elephants together. And so there also seems to be like intergroup and intragroup fission and fusion, maybe, which mm-hmm. I also think is really interesting. I'd love to learn more about like, what are the conditions under which one of those things happens or doesn't happen? I assume it's somewhat about resources and somewhat about territory and things but elephants on the whole do not seem particularly territorial relative to other animals right so there's there's something about the like there's room for all of us <laughs> nature of elephants that i i think taps back into that original feeling i was describing of like a melancholy as opposed mm-hmm. to like a mine versus yours or like this is my box that i can fit in so yeah something i read was saying that i mean this is the fusion fission idea right but that there's that cooperation and competition live right next to each other Mm. and at multiple levels in elephant societies. And it reminds me of something that a mentor of mine said to me. I was starting to study holarchies and I was having this feeling uh, as I was doing my dissertation, which is like, I, how am I to say, who am I to say that anything is better than anything else? Right. Like kind of, if you put everything on the same plane, like, any choice that anyone makes is fine, right? This kind of like moral relativism or something like this. Mm -hmm. And my mentor said to me, well, let's, let's be clear. Like some things are better than other things. And I think this is particularly true in a cooperative society, right? There has to be some kind of clear order. There Mm. needs to be some sort of set of rules. Uh, I was even looking at uh, elephant mating and there's, this sort of clear hierarchy and like what is a better mate versus what is a worse mate, right? So just saying that human or that elephants, I did it again. <laughs> elephants are cooperative or they're really supportive of one another, or we seem to see that they come together in groups when there's resource scarcity rather than pitting against one another. Yet there is a clear hierarchy within elephant mm. societies, even around like what's a more desirable mate, right? They're not like, like Bob the elephant has a bigger brain, so like I'm into him. It's like actually still in elephant society, like the bigger, stronger, more aggressive, like higher testosterone males are still the more attractive mates. And that's right. just true, right? Some some things are better than other things, even in a cooperative elephant society. That sounds really insightful to me. As you're naming it back, I was I'm wondering if that's as you're naming it back to me, I'm thinking like, yeah, there is room for me to expand my definition of leadership but also like collectivism and still have hierarchy as part of it right like we're not talking about collaboration meaning free for all we're not talking about collaboration meaning chaos and no decision making we're not talking about collaboration as like lack of clear decider or ownership or any of that there's like seems like elephants kind of rock at the what is everyone needing? But also like I matriarch need to decide. And now I will make that decision and people will follow. Mm-hmm. And 
I don't know. That's a really powerful kind of leadership that I don't see as on display as much. I either see like kind of collectivism um, without decisiveness mm-hmm. or followership mm-hmm. or domination without care. And yeah. elephants seem to marry those two things in a kind of beautiful way. Yeah, they do. I- um, and like, I think that my brain is kind of, or my mind is kind of blown by this. <laughs> like, I don't even really know how to wrap my head totally around it. But with the trauma lens, one of the impacts from the trauma on the herd is also uh, poorer decision making yeah. or a lack of decision making, right? And I was just thinking, like, is some of the lack of decision making that we see in more cooperative human organizations, uh, due to that kind of brain fuzz that comes when there's a trauma reaction. I'm just thinking about women, right, who maybe come together, want to create a really cooperative organization, and then maybe struggle to move forward, right? It's overly democratic, right? It becomes slow or clunky or lacks lacks kind of the benefits of hierarchy matched with the benefits of a cooperation. Um, and I w- just wondered if for humans, trauma might be a mediating factor as well. Other thing you're reminding me of is that so many of the animals we've looked at so far, it's really felt to me like the health of the individual is more important than the health of the system. Mm. And that feels like it gets inverted with elephants where like the health of the, I'm just going to call it like organization or the group is actually about the health of the social and behavioral dynamics going on amongst the herd, not just the individuals within it. And um, I was reading that part of the way that matriarchs, and actually it seems like some of the higher ranking um, male elephants as well, one of the ways they manage and resolve conflict is essentially like they put their bodies between conflicting elephants. They literally like intervene and step in. And I'm just like imagining my human version of it is like, chill out, chill out. (laughs) This is not important. (laughs) And there's something about that that reads like, you as an individual matter, you as an individual also matter. But what matters more is neither of us as individuals. It's like the collective actually functioning well. And there's something about that kind of leadership that is very inspiring to me. It's like seeing individuals for their uniqueness, but also recognizing that the health of the actual system is at a system level, not at an individual. Can I take us one click deeper on this? Yeah, where you want to go? Okay, I was I was on site with a client last week, and I was in their office, and there was a big leadership meeting, so a bunch of people were in the office, despite it being a remote first company. And for the first time, and it's been I don't know, maybe six months or more since I was in their office, I was starting to feel again the organization as an organism. Like I was starting to see the holistic functioning of the group. It's like watching like who ducks into a room to talk about something, who's hanging out in the kitchen, like how is the feeling and like the collective Mm -hmm. pulse of the organization moving. And that thing that you just described that elephants do, I found myself doing, we were in a, a leadership meeting. We were having a large group discussion around some pretty spicy topics. And there were a couple of leaders in the room who were starting to go at it with each other around something that wasn't quite the core issue, right? They were kind of spinning off into that, uh, maybe I would call it like the the elephant version is like the high testosterone aggressive behavior. Mm-hmm. And I literally put my body between them. Hmm. And it's like, I just got called from me. Like, I'm going to just put my body between them. Look at both of them in the eyes, like essentially in the way that I say it, like, you're okay. Come back to the group. And hmm. it, and the the conflict was immediately resolved and we came back to the group. And the question mark that I have after all of this is, okay, elephants, elephants have this sort of organism thing down, right? They seem to, they can feel communication from hundreds of miles away, right? Through these kinds of uh, rumblings that they send through the earth, right? They can sense where their elephants are in space and time, right? They don't forget who are their, who are their other elephants, right? Who are my friends? And they also use touch and the proximity of their bodies all the time to communicate and move the feeling of the group. And my question mark is, 
remote work question mark <laughs> i'm so glad you brought that up because i was just thinking about this sort of new finding in the last couple decades around that elephants to what you're talking about basically can communicate on this like intrasonic level with like such low frequency that it's out of the range of our perception or something like that. Did I get that right? <laughs> Sounds I, right enough. Basically, yeah, we can't hear it. it. So we didn't know about it. But it seems like elephants have the ability to sort of send vocalizations and sounds at frequencies we cannot really perceive that can travel across vast distances, aka remote life, <laughs> and and be able to sense like uh, send and receive information about like danger, location, needs, et cetera, which they also can kind of pick up through their feet. It seems like that's the latest understanding is that they have like special sensors in like their feet, their skin, and their ears. Of course, they can hear things through their ears. And that, oh, that just like gave me chills to think about like the literal groundedness yeah. of that kind of communication that like there's something deep, deep, deep. It's like a low sound that is like felt more than thought about that communicates something so rich and it seems like that's what happened for you in the in the room it's like there is some deep felt sense of where you should put your body in space mm -hmm. based off of like what wasn't necessarily being said but like the hum that you could feel yeah yeah and i mean there's two things in there that pop out for me. One is the just the proximity to other bodies, I think gives us more information, right? And I imagine that if elephants were communicating via Zoom across continents, they probably would also struggle to feel the low vibration yeah. of each other, right? So there's, there's some sort of proximity thing there. Um, and then the second thing is, I mean, I love that you said the literal groundedness, but I'm thinking about what allowed me to to catch that transmission. Mm -hmm. And like there had to be figurative groundedness. I mean, my feet were on the ground, but but figuratively, Energetically, my, like my you're kind ear of... was to the ground, right? In a way, or like right. I was grounded in myself so that there was a place where I could hear metaphorically right. what was not being said. Right. And like how many of oh. us have lost that yeah. ability? Yeah, it's like you were a kind of a tuning fork of sorts. And mm. so like you could actually get some resonance as opposed to like if you hold the tuning fork with, you know, contact, nothing's going to resonate. It's like doesn't have the chamber or the freedom to actually have the transmission, as you put it, like kind of go through it. Yeah. What a beautiful visual, first of all. <laughs> I feel like we're in like it's such a it just feels right kind of body wise, like. There's a yes energy for me around it. Mm -hmm. And what a beautiful transition, I think, actually, for us to talk about, like, what we have to learn from these creatures, from all of this amazingness. But is there anything else you want to name as, you know, little snippets or bullet points of just, like, the facts <laughs> of who these creatures are and what they do? Maybe we'll get to talk about it a little bit more, but I wanted to pull just, like, one more thread on this ritual idea. Yes. because. Right. I think the rituals are kind of the bookends or the grounding of the organism, of the organization. Hmm. And uh, I, it just popped in my head because I was I was having a walk uh, a couple of days ago with my partner's mom, who said that she witnessed an elephant birth. No, what? And it was an it was like an accident. They were like on a walking safari, and like an elephant was being oh, born, wow. and. And what was amazing to her that she said this, and this was before my research on elephants, uh, was that there was a congregation of elephants around this event happening, mm -hmm. right? It's not like the elephant, like, like shamefully stumbles out into the woods and like plop a baby elephant comes out. Like, <laughs> it's not like that. There's a, there's a full ritual around it, right? And it, it called back this, uh, this image that I have from some of the, uh, one of the professors that I had in in undergrad, um, he's from Kenya, and he said that when there's a birth happening, the entire village comes together and circles, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, and that's what elephants do, which is amazing. And same with a death, they will circle the the dead individual and cover it with leaves and investigate the body and get curious seemingly curious around what's happening but there's a coming together that happens around birth death collective traumas 
And they even will get curious about deaths or events that happen with individuals who are not affiliated with themselves, right? If they happen across a dead elephant, the whatever group is here will investigate that and attend to it. Um, so that also had me thinking around if, if the organism is so important, if the organization is so important, what are the features, right? Being grounded, getting that transmission, right? The subtle or that deep vibrational communication, touch, proximity, and maybe rituals, right? It might be mm. some of the main features. So I wanted to throw that in there because I think for me, that's one of the takeaways potentially. Yeah, it seems moving to you as you're describing it. Yeah, it is moving to me. What about the ritual is like, like, it's you like that? Well, I, I don't know if there's like a, let me start with a story that comes up and then let me see if I can back into your question. There was a class that I took in college on the psychology of addiction. Mm -hmm. And the psychology of addiction is particularly interesting to me because I grew up in a family where addiction was a, a pretty traumatic feature of my childhood. And I think in a lot of ways, yeah, I've shaped me into who I am and how I interact with the world. And also I think triggered my sense of interdependence. So mm -hmm. I think in a way this is like where this idea of elephants really hits me in my heart. Mm -hmm. It's like there's something about the way elephants operate that just deeply resonates with the way I feel. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came out of this exploration of the psychology of addiction uh, is, I'll try to say it in a pithy statement, but one of the reasons potentially that humans are so drawn to being in an altered state, right, to using drugs is that we need something to help us transition from one state to another. And the birth and death cycles are those triggering moments. And one of the, one of the things that we explored in that class and then I further explored in my own research was that the transition from adolescence to adulthood is actually a death and rebirth the death mm -hmm. of a childhood self, a rebirth of an adult self. And it's around the time that we start to see humans seek altered states, mm -hmm. maybe almost as a way to force the experience of death, right? To create a ritual and to pull a community around the experience of needing to be different, to, to birth something else. And so it struck me so profoundly that elephants do this quite naturally, I would assume. Um, that they recognize the need for a community around a ritual, right? A, marking a change uh, in the organization. I don't know why, but as you were talking, I was a, I was sort of imagining their rituals of transition, I guess, but for other animals. We're not talking about other animals, but, you know, like the molting process is essentially yeah. a shedding of self into a new self. Maybe we'll get there in another episode. But, and usually that happens like solo. It's like a solo molting process. Yeah. So it's, you're making me wonder like, okay, there's ritual, there's transformation moment, birth, death, but there's also this social aspect of it mm -hmm. that feels particularly important for elephants. Yeah. And that's bringing me back to why, which is bringing me back to like the brain and the social structure and the cognitive function and this idea of we only briefly touched on it, but like self-awareness or what researchers, I think they call like mirror self-recognition, the ability to like see yourself in a mirror and actually know that it is you and not an, mm. another creature, which basically most, an like most animals, we don't, we don't know of many animals except for like apes, humans, maybe dolphins, and maybe elephants that have this. So I'm thinking winding thought, like, what is it about group ritual that's so important? And why it's like the more complex the awareness, the more people think, researchers seem to think this is like you have the ability to empathize and you also have the ability for altruism because mm -hmm. you recognize self versus other. Mm -hmm. And in that like me versus or us and-ness <laughs> of it, then, then the like group ritual potentially becomes more important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, there's so much here. We could do a whole other episode just on this aspect. Okay, and but let's transition to the org, like what we can learn. Sounds good. Okay, sounds so good. So what comes top of mind for you in all of our threads? We've got the matriarchy. We've got long-term memory. We've got drama, interge- intergenerational trauma awareness and impact, self-awareness. What are you thinking? I mean, I think for me, it's this last thing, which is that somehow the collective awareness seems to create a resilience in mm. and and I, I i didn't say this but the other thing that they have noticed in some of the research is that if redundancy is created in the herd then then the herds are quite resilient, resilient. to the traumas right which is i mean if you think about startups right one of the features of a startup is to not have redundancy right we have just what we need and and yet we're quite interdependent in an early company. I mean, always, right? Companies are interdependent by their nature, um, even though we may try to strip that awareness out by creating overly strict hierarchies and roles and independent or individual incentives, right? That that pull an organization in two ways. Like, ah, I'm competitive. Ah, I'm cooperative. So, like, what mm-hmm. could we learn from elephants around that cooperative and competitive nature? Um, and one of those things that, you know, the elephant research shows is that redundancy is helpful in that. Collective mm-hmm. rituals seems to be helpful in that. Some sort of like deep connective tissue communication seems to be helpful in that. Maybe my example is like sometimes being in person and co-regulating with our bodies and being grounded and letting the experience of other human beings resonate in ourselves seems to be promoting of the marriage of competition and cooperation yeah and this piece also about actually being able to sense or feel what is going on with the organism not just within yourself or even within one other person like I I have definitely had experiences myself of feeling like I kind of know what's going on for me and I kind of know what's going on with my like closest colleagues and I know what's going on with like the team that I lead maybe and I might have like an inkling of a sense maybe because i'm sensitive about like the broader organism but rarely for example in fact never have i ever seen (laughs) 360 performance reviews that aren't about an individual (laughs) or like team performance evaluations that are not about an individual or Mm -hmm. team promotion cycles (laughs) that are not about an individual right we have this way Mm -hmm. of saying like we're gonna kind of corner off in your little your little square, like, how did you do? And I think that makes sense in a lot of contexts because, like, how will you evaluate people <laughs> and decide whether you should keep them hired or fired, right? promoted or not? And elephants are making me wonder, like, <laughs> what does an organization look like that doesn't have performance reviews for any individual but has collective performance reviews where there's actual consequences for the collective, not just the individuals within it? Have you ever seen anything like that? Um, no, but I love the idea. And it's definitely been talked about in some of the spaces that I'm in, right? But it it feels like maybe it's because of the culture we're in or because of those individual rewards, right? It's really hard to break out of this kind of individualistic culture. Yeah. Um, but I did like have a little snarkiness in me, which is, and like Pylea does this when we partner with organizations, Each month, we essentially give the entire system a 360. And that's like a part of the work that we do, right? And part of the, probably the reason that this whole elephant thing resonates so deeply with me, right? Is that um, I'm essentially trying to create an elephant-like organization. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't even know that I was mimicking the elephants, but I'm so with you, right? If we can, if we can create some awareness and some accountability to the group as a whole, how does that change the way that we operate? And, you know, does it, does it actually activate that idea that, or the gestalt that's possible, right? That if we all can come together truly and work together as a team, as one organism, can we do more than we could do as a mere collection of individuals? I mean, I think yes. And I think it's touching on like what happens coming back to the leadership team, uh, kind of on site you were talking about is like, if everyone had the perspective of I am a tuning fork in this moment and mm-hmm. I will put my body in between moments of tension for the sake of resolution, not to ignore it, not to avoid it, not to pretend it doesn't exist, but actually because like that's not what the focus needs to be in this moment. Like 
if people took that spirit on everybody on a team, I just wonder like, what what does that team function like? If everybody's job is to be a tuning fork for the whole organism. I really love that question. And it calls up, I was at, I was at a retreat a couple weeks ago. And the premise of the retreat is that we operate as one organism. Cool. Um, which, you know, is pretty different for most of us if we live also in this individualistic society. And the, the, there's a couple of ways that we were playing with that as a group. And one is that if I'm helping to heal you, I'm also healing me. So mm-hmm. there's like this amazing thing, which is like, if it's happening to we, it's also happening to me. Like, mm-hmm. it's just true, actually, right? If we're, right, like, I am not separate from the collective environment that I am part of. And in trying to sort of reject that, it is an isolating mechanism. Yeah. And just like the elephants, I think for humans, and we're seeing this with intergenerational trauma, right? That even if we're not aware that something happened to the collective, our bodies and our nervous systems are taking that on and adjusting our biology, adjusting the way we interact with each other, adjusting our ability to reproduce and remember tasks and engage in procedural memory, just like elephants, that's happening to us. Anytime something happens to the collective, like we are forever changed, even if we're not conscious of it. It's giving me (laughs) chills. I'm like, every new person that joins a team is on some level an orphaned elephant. Yeah. And there's like an opportunity to sort of like be a mediating factor, like an organism or organization can be a mediating factor to that orphan's sort of erratic, uh, maybe unregulated energy, or it can breed more erratic, aggressive, flighty, fighty, appeasy energy. And I think most... I I haven't thought as concretely about leadership as about kind of an energetic mediating and holding an or, organism awareness as much as a, like, I take ownership over the outcomes, which still mm. feels very, um, I don't know, there's something that energetically that feels different for me about those two premises a little bit. Yeah, it's like almost if we take the tuning fork route rather than the I'm accountable like transactional approach like could we shift the organization from a rhino killing organization (laughs) defeat all competitors (laughs) to one that has resilience and longevity and wisdom in our decision making and like what yeah I mean the question that you already asked which is like what's possible if if we as humans are able to make that shift I wanted to bring up something else I was curious about in application for leaders listening, which is about the deep valuing of experience that exists in the elephant world, right? So the Mm. whole concept of a matriarchy and, well, even also on some level, some versions of the patriarchy, basically anything where there's like a hierarchy, there is a version of it that's like really rooted in actual experience. Like I know better because I have done it before it's like (laughs) i know where to go find the water because for 70 years i have learned where the water is or where the waters are (laughs) or when this situation comes to me here's a range of ways i might decide to deal with it Mm -hmm. elephants seem to like deeply value experience (laughs) and the reason i want to bring it up is because i'm thinking of like every startup i've worked in there is definitely experience matters But also, Mm -hmm. like, a lot of the premise of startup is, like, innovation and not being the one who's, like, the incumbent with Mm -hmm. all the experience in a given market. And so I just wanted to ask you, like, what do you think the role is? Or, like, how? what do leaders have to learn about elephants' perspective on the value of experience that you think could be pulled in more? Or when should that be pulled in to their own style their own practices yeah Uh, i think it's a complicated question but what i (laughs) what i really like about it is that there's again this kind of tension of opposites right we have cooperation and and competition but we also have 
like novelty and innovation against like learning Wisdom. and yeah, like this, this thing. And what I think we're seeing with elephants is that they're actually quite adaptable. So elephants actually also, I read in a paper, which I kind of blew my mind, but also makes sense, have learned to navigate racial and cultural differences in humans. What? They can identify the racial and cultural group identity of humans, and they seem to be able to know the difference in threat level based on the culture of the humans that are approaching them. Okay, we're definitely going to need to link to that. Like, I have all sorts of mind blown, eyes wide open hearing you say that. Yeah, I put a little note next to that, which was like, what? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're describing their like kind of ability to respond in novel situations, pattern match and make decisions around right. that, which suggests a degree of like lack of rigidity. Right. They're not they're not just doing the thing that they've always done because it's the way they've always done it. Right. Like the Asian elephants adapted to a totally new habitat. They now no longer have trees and jungles, which their bodies were actually adapted entirely and their societies were adapted entirely to live in dense jungles. Hmm. And now they're like plain animals and they figured it out like kind of immediately. Like the stories of it are like, and then the elephants emerge from the forest and now they're fine. Like it's amazing. Like they just innovated so quickly to become a totally different kind of animal. And yet they don't lose any of the wisdom that still works. Hmm. And so like, I'm feeling that elephants live in that tension in a really Hmm. beautiful way. Somehow they Hmm. know what to keep but they're also adaptable and constantly shifting the way that they pass on the learnings uh, in a way that's responsive to their environment. Okay, so we know you're obsessed with elephants. I know, right? I know, I know. You're like elephant advocate number one over here. <laughs> I did have like, I put a little question mark. I was like, not disruptors, innovators, challengers, question mark, but I am liking the framing that you're giving me, which is like, maybe the superpower of the elephant is actually holding polarization without needing to choose between and like somehow being able to like live in the paradox of that really effectively, which is really distinct from say like the cheetah whose like core skill is to be like laser focused on one thing and optimize everything else around speed. Like to me, that's not living in a paradox at all. That's like really choosing a side and there's like power to that too. So yeah, you're inspiring me to think about the power, the leadership quality of the elephant as being about holding opposition Mm -hmm. with as not oppositional. It definitely seems maybe that's a thing. And if I if I had to sum up everything about elephants into a word, it would be complicated. Mm. They're just complicated. I would not have selected that word. I would have chosen like regal or like. What is it for me? It's actually like it feels very um, it's like it feels very consonant Mm. for me. And what Mm. I mean by that is like even though I have more questions, I have more curiosities, but I don't have confusion Mm -hmm. around elephants and complexity kind of brings up that word for me brings up like confusion or like uh, how could I ever understand that for me as we're talking about it elephants are like consonant maybe because I maybe this is it I tend to be a drifter between groups and like ways of being and for a long time that felt like maybe I just don't know who I am and I'm like Mm -hmm. kind of a chameleon and I don't have a sense of self But as I kind of grow more and more into myself and like love myself more, I realize that like the paradox, for example, of being like businessy or being woo, I'm like, yes, I am the elephant of that paradox. (laughs) Like, give me the Oracle deck and also let me dig into your database and like understand how to optimize your funnels and loop. Like both. Um, And so there's a consonance for me around Mm. elephants if I think about them as a paradox, because I I feel both like I have a lot of masculine energy, which is kind of anti-matriarchal, and I have a lot of like down with the patriarchy, like (laughs) free spirit. And so I'm really, okay, now now I'm vibing with the elephant in a new way. Thank you. Yeah, I like that consonance. If you could give people kind of 
a learning or something that they could walk away from today's conversation about elephants with? What stands out to you, Kari? Mm, the reminder that I might issue to myself and to leaders is listen through your feet. <laughs> How about you? I want a nice pithy one like you have. <laughs> Let me look back at my notes. Okay, I'm going to go with systemic health over individual survival. Beautiful. And that means like, yeah, be the tuning fork. Think of the collective as an organism. Recognize that no individual is the reason it's working or not, and that every individual has a responsibility for the whole organism's health. Yeah, beautiful. Can I add one more fun fact? <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, so there are two. There are two kind of predecessors of the modern elephant. Mm -hmm. One is my favorite, the woolly mammoth, right? Which is really fun. And then there's also a straight tusked elephant. And when the people who do these things look back at their bones, fossils, et cetera, and then make some assumptions about how long these beings lived, it was about 60 years old, mm -hmm. which is a really long time, like way longer than like the earliest versions of humans lived. Right. And somehow the elephant species has maintained their longevity for the entirety of their existence and humans have improved over time, right? Our, our, we now live longer than elephants, but elephants used to live longer than humans. And I just think about like what from that society creates this sort of consistency and longevity. Mm. Uh, like that just something about that kind of just blew my mind. Like woolly mammoths lived to be 60 years old. And like when I humans think, were living to like teens, 20s. Yeah. Like something that they were doing, Worked they were out. doing right. Maybe it was the furry bigness. I don't know. Maybe it was the sensitive feetness. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining this week's show. Credit to Zach and the team at Supermix for helping us make this show sound professional. If you want any more deets on us, the podcast, or past episodes, visit us at instinctpodcast.com. There you can leave us a note or a review. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, if you liked this episode, please subscribe everywhere, wherever you get your podcasts. See you next week.